Okay, so now on to baby's language development. One of the unique features of humans is our use of language. When we study language, we see that no other animal uses anything close to human language. I'll give you an example. The best ape we ever got to do sign language, or, or, or they actually use a, sort of this machine that's got buttons on it that represent symbols that represent something in the environment. So it's, a, it's an approximation of language. The best ape we ever got was this uh, bonobo called um, Kanzi. And he had like 400 words. There, are, There's even um, some evidence in the book, it talks about the psychologist with the border collie and that border collie has like a thousand, at least a thousand words, vocabulary, you know, and it, it basically it's this, uh, you can tell it to go in the other room and get a toy by a thousand different names and it will get the correct toy a thousand different ways. Pretty cool, good job border collie. Good job, Kanzi. The average three-year-old, average, not the best, not the best speaking three-year-old, the average three-year-old has a thousand word vocabulary. I'm gonna show you each of these logos one by one and you'll tell us what they are, okay? Yeah. All right. A push a wagon. Welcome. Ringing. Embassy. Ahana. A friend. Uh, mother. Yeah. Flood. Angry. Back. Uh, McDonald's. Uh, uh, um, by you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm by you. Yeah. Uh, uh, tail. 
Burger King. Burger? Burger King, yeah. Burger King. I'll charge Santa Bring. Uh, work it. <laughs> Cash. Toyota. Uh, Humans learn language in an immense way. By the time, from the time they're three until they're 17, they're learning like nine new words a day. That's a ridiculous, you try and learn nine new words a day. What you'll realize is that babies' brains are little sponges for language. They're oriented to learn words. They wanna learn words. It, they seek it out. And it also happens really cool in the same process globally. So humans have a process for learning language that was described by Noam Chomsky as a language acquisition device. And what he showed is that cross-culturally, children learn language in the same sequence. Now, languages are very different. You know, we've got like 4,000 languages and uh, we're losing a lot every day. Um, it's because there are languages that um, when people are bilingual, they'll speak a, a native tongue of their tribe from the place that they came, but then now they're in a big city and they speak the sort of nationalized language and then their children speak that language less and they speak more the nationalized language. So we are losing languages, but interestingly, um, children have the propensity to learn any human language when they're born, any language they're exposed to. In fact, there's a, a critical period, whereas if you expose kids to languages prior to, um, let's say two years old, then they're gonna be able to hear and discern phonemes in that language. But if you don't expose them to that particular, um, if you don't expose them to that particular language, they might struggle as adults to hear the, dis the subtle distinctions between things. Classic one in Mandarin is C and C. C and C. So these subtle distinctions, you might hear me saying C, C, but I'm not, I'm saying C and C, which are subtle differences. If you've been exposed to that language, then you'll, you'll have been able to discern a difference between those slight little tiny phonemes that I'm, that I'm shifting there. I'm, I'm not doing it correctly, I'm not a native speaker, but that is an example of how it will be difficult for us. The L and er is difficult for a Mandarin speaker who was not exposed to English to discern between ul and er. Uh, this also explains why people who have accents sometimes make the similar mistakes in their pronunciation of language because they can't hear that difference. And so when they're gonna produce it, uh, they're hearing it as one thing and then they're not able to discern that it's another. Um, so when they repeat it, they, they might sound as though they didn't understand the word but really it's just that they weren't exposed to it at an early age. So how do babies start language? First, they have to start by hearing it. Talking to babies is imperative. Now, a lot of parents will try to talk to babies in utero, which is wonderful, but it's not really um, when the benefit happens. What it does is it really bonds the parents to the baby. Talking to a baby in utero, when you, you know, go down to the little bump on her belly and you start, oh baby, I love you. Great, because that's doing something to your mind. It's orienting you to the future of raising this child. That's wonderful. It's not necessarily doing anything for their particular um, brain development with language. When they're born, however, and they're exposed to these um, linguistic experiences, that's really important that, that you talk to them. There is some research, and it's in the book, that shows that 
Babies in low socioeconomic status and babies in high socioeconomic status learn language at different rates. It's on a different trajectory. And the reason it's on a different trajectory, it's thought to be because there's so much more use of language in the home. So much more use of language in the home is the difference between them. It's not that babies who are poor can't learn language as well as rich babies, but it's that they're not exposed to language as much. So this is a really important thing to note talking to your baby all the time. When we start talking to babies, we start talking out using something that's called infant directed speech, or I like the term motherese better. And it's a really wonderful thing that human evolution has caused parents, mothers specifically, to speak differently to their infant children than they do to say other children who are grown up or other adults. So right now I'm speaking to you in like normal language, but if I was speaking to an infant, I would be doing couple things. One of them is, I would elongate my words. Specifically, the vowel sounds. I'm going to elongate vowel sounds. So you have consonant sounds and vowel sounds. For children to learn language, if you elongate your words. See how d is quick, but er, that, that vowel sound is a longer sound. It enables them to hear it better, hear those distinctions between the phonemes. And so motherese, it's a natural thing. You don't have to take a class in motherese. Infant directed speech is what the book calls it. You don't have to do any of that. You do it automatically. You know, I watch my 12 year old. He, uh, he, he likes little kids and he's very good with them. He's very patient and, and engages them. And I, I listen to him and, and what he does is he doesn't quite elongate his words as much, but he, he his voice is dropping now. <laughs> that happened like a month ago. but he'll raise it up an octave. So that's another thing we do with infant directed speech, motherese. You don't have to be a mother to do it. I did it to all my boys. I'm not their mother, but I did motherese with them. And that is that you, hey baby. So instead of me down here in this low tone, big man bearded guy, no, I go, hey baby. And that upper register, uh, taking it up an octave, really helps the baby to be able to hear it correctly and it helps them to pay attention to it. So those are things that adults do to help babies learn speech. Another thing is, is that they engage them in their environment with what they're doing, with what they're looking at, right? This thing called social referencing where the baby learns to look where you're looking. You know, if I look and I go, hey, dog, dog, do you see the puppy? Doggy, right? So I, I elongate the word. I raise my voice, I point to, I look at, and I, and I even change dog into doggy, puppy, because that, e, that, that um, vowel sound helps them to pay attention. I don't do that on purpose. That's just normally what we do. She's passed out. Um, so that's something that adults do to help kids. Now, what do kids do? What did Noam Chomsky say? Kids do universally in all languages. Remember, all these different languages but they all learn language the same way. They start out with the vowel sounds of the language. Uh, different languages have different vowel sounds, um, and those will, those will be important in a second when I tell you about the one group of people that don't use child-directed speech. Um, for example, uh, you know, some languages have more letters in their alphabet. Some uh, have more different phonemes. In English, we have 26 letters and about 40 different phonemes that we use. Give or take, because there's some d discrepancy over whether some are really distinctive or not, but about 40 phonemes. So that's what the basis of language is that kids learn. What they all start doing in any language, you know, there are some languages that only have like 13 letters in it. Um, what they all do initially is they begin to mimic vowel sounds. Now you see why it's so important that um, we use child-directed speech where we're elongating those vowel sounds and they're beginning to sort of lay down the foundation for hearing a word and then being able to reproduce it. They do this thing initially called cooing. This is the ah, ee, ooh sort of uh, sound of children. And those cooings are all vowel-like sounds and it lasts for up to four months-ish. By four months, they're going to start to do something where they're incorporating the consonant sounds. Consonant sounds are the s, m, d, t, p, right? So they're, they're learning how to use their mouth, buco, oral, lingual, um, 
all the sort of different features of how we articulate our words, right? There's a lot of dynamic movement in the mouth. And the reason that babies can't talk so well is that they have to learn to master the mouth gymnastics that it is to speak. Not only that, but we have to change the way our uh, uh, diaphragm is passing air across our vocal cords. And so there's a, this is an absolute fantastic gymnastics of motoric behavior to speak. And again, they're just learning to move. Babbling is that combining cooing with consonant sounds. And that's around six months is when babbling happens. It's really fun. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, holophase, which is o a full word, right? So um, last night we had, uh, we had to babysit uh, a neighbor kid. Long story, we don't have anybody in our house, right? We're still quarantined, but there was a, a baby that needed to be watched last night for a really good reason. So we had him come over and we, I, I was talking with him and trying to engage him and we have a cat, an old cat. And so his name's Frogger. And I was trying to talk to him. He's about this age of holophase where he does the one word thing. I said, this cat's name's Frogger, right? Kitty Frogger, Kitty Frogger. I kept combining these things. It's a cat, its name's Frogger. And he got frog. So he could repeat frog, right? He didn't get frogger or kitty, but he got frog. And I go, yeah, right? And I, I show him elation that I'm really excited that he got that cat's name. I didn't mind that he, I didn't say, no, his name's Frogger. Get it right, kid. I, I, elate, I was elated that he was repeating what I was saying and he was intrigued by the cat and that was a good inter, inter, personal relationship language learning experience for him. As he develops, he's going to begin to combine those single words from holophase, which happens 12 months to a year and a half ish, which that's like his age. Later, he's going to start to develop multiple words together. He'll say fluffy kitty, right? Fluffy kitty, two words together. That's at about two ish years. Another story about my dad, uh, and this is a, an important one. When he was the last born of uh, his siblings and he was, uh, his parents were farmers and they were out in the fields working and his mom did sort of the, the books and did the office work and did all that um, traditional um, administrative work. And so they had a nanny that raised him, but his mom, kind of figured like he was different from the other kids that she had had. You know, they were all much older than him. He was like a, a big distance younger. And so she took him to the pediatrician and is like, you know, he's two and he's not talking. There's something wrong with him. Doc, is this kid retarded, right? So that's the use of the term was appropriate at the time. But she was concerned that he wasn't developing because he wasn't speaking. She wasn't hearing him speak. And she knew that the other kids, my two uncles and aunt were all, when they were growing up, they were speaking at that age and, and he wasn't. So doctor examines him and says, uh, Mrs. Frizee, um, your child speaks wonderful Spanish. Do you have any help raising him? His nanny was a Mexican woman named Maria and she spoke to him all the time. So he was developing Spanish perfectly fine, but because his parents were gone, he's being raised by a nanny, he's being exposed to Spanish. Uh, to this day, he's fluent in Spanish, and that's a, a particularly wonderful thing. Not that his mother was so neglectful he didn't speak English yet, but that brings me to bilingualism. Bilingualism is a wonderful thing, but it does change developmental trajectory for children, specifically in schools it takes longer to learn multiple languages. And so what we see is that kids that are learning multiple languages as they're younger end up falling behind in some of the schooling that they uh, attend. But there's great news. By the time they're about my oldest kid's age, 12, they catch up academically to their peers and they're bilingual. So that's a good thing to do. Uh, and bilingualism is a huge benefit to people. It helps them to think more deeply. There are words in certain languages that we don't have in, in our language, in English, so they can express themselves in, in even greater ways. And code switching, which is to switch between uh, one language and the other, is, is a higher form. It's a, it shows more activity in the brain's language areas. 
Uh, so it's good to be bilingual. Also, early exposure is very important. Let's talk about critical periods. So there's some sad news, and that is the book talks about one of these examples of children who are called feral children. You know, like a, we have a feral cat just showed up one day in our backyard, and you know we feed him in the garage now sometimes, and he kills rats around here and leaves us presents. But he's not like our normal cat. He doesn't want to be touched so much. He's not social. You know, he's he's a lone lone wolf, a lone lion. There are feral children, and those are children who don't have the type of exposure and touch and interaction and love and connectedness and experiences that children need to, to develop normally. And Jeannie was one of them. Unfortunately, she was from here, our home state of California, um, and they found her, um, officials found her when she was 13 years old. She'd basically been tied to a bed or left in a closet with like a little, one of those little kids potties. And she'd been beaten severely if she ever made noise. Uh, this poor girl, 13 when they found her, couldn't speak. She became a ward of the state when they took her parents away and obviously imprisoned them. But the damage that they did by neglect basically made her incapable of learning to speak. She didn't have the requisite brain capability to learn language because she wasn't exposed to it. Again, the more words you get, the better for the kids. So bilingualism, bilingualism is great, uh, and you, you should definitely teach your kids to speak multiple languages. I used to work at UCSF. We were doing research on polyglots. Those are people that spoke multiple languages to see where uh, language in their brain was localized. And uh, it was pretty awesome stuff. And my mentor, Dr. Walker, uh, told me this. He said, do you know what people are called that speak, you know, four or more languages? It's polyglot, many tongues. Uh, so there's many tongues. People who speak three languages are called trilingual, right? So tri, so that's three, and then lingual, tongue, so three languages. People that speak two languages we call bilingual. And people who speak one language are called American. So that's, that's your one, one joke for me from linguistics. Uh, okay, so once children get that initial stages of telegraphic speech where they start to say, you know, look, doggy, then they begin to add to that, right? They'll start to add articles, the dog, look, the dog. That is my dog, right? These, these sort of simple sentences, like the ones in the little books that taught you to read. That's how people learn to speak, and then they, they build up to multiple uh, sentences. You know, by the time they're four years old, they're talking their minds out, just constant stream of consciousness talking. And, uh, and it's quite, quite enjoyable to see them learn to develop language. So that's language development in children. By the time they're 17, the average person has a vocabulary, if they're a monolinguistic English speaker, of about 60,000 words. They can speak 60,000 words. This is a, an incredible accomplishment, which is a magnitude of order larger than any animal that we've ever uh, been able to teach any use of language and words. Um, oh, apes can't do words because they, they, can't, they can't stop the air that's coming out when, when you hear, you know, howler monkeys that go, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. they, ho. They can't go, ha, ha, ha. They can't stop the air coming across. So even if we could get them to do language, they would have to like, okay, I want a banana. They couldn't say, okay, I want a banana. They couldn't do that staccato thing that enables us to separate words from each other. So even if they could do language here, they're physically incapable of doing it. And we found out some of that stuff. If you want to read more about the research that found that out, um, it's, it's in the book, uh, The First Word by Christine Kennelly. It's one of my favorite books. If you're just needing lots more books, uh, that's a good one to read. Okay, on to the next thing.